James chapter 1. If we continue to look this morning at how our faith is to be lived down in real life. James chapter 1 and we will begin in verse 1. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. Lord, I ask for your help this morning in sharing your word. I ask for your help in understanding how it applies to my life. I ask for your help in the lives of all of us here today. Help us to be receptive. Holy Spirit, please work in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Do you ever feel that no matter what you do, and no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to get ahead? You just can't seem to get a break? Do you ever feel like things were pressing in on you from every side? Have you ever simply wanted to quit? Gotten tired of fighting, gotten tired of trying, and simply want to run away and start over again? Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Some people have the mistaken idea that when you become a Christian, you don't have any more struggles, you don't have any more trials. Suddenly, you've got it all together. That's nonsense. My friend, when you know and love Jesus, when you realize the standards he calls his disciples to live up to, it can be overwhelming. All of a sudden, you're hit with the realization that God has given you a great honor to be his ambassador. But with that great honor also comes an awesome responsibility. You and I are called to be ambassadors for Christ, to be his representatives in the world we're called to be loving husbands and wives, encouraging our spouses. We're given the responsibility of being godly parents. And it's tough, between, it's tough finding the balance between love and discipline, between encouragement and discipline. And just when you think you got it all together, you slip. The other day I was stopped at a red light at the corner of uh, Longwood, Lake Mary Road, and Lake Mary Boulevard. I was sitting there at the light facing Lake Mary Boulevard when a young man came riding his bike down Lake Mary Boulevard, and in spite of the traffic light, he decided to cut across traffic. A car driving down Lake Mary Boulevard slammed on brakes, not knowing where he was going to try to avoid hitting him. And this young man decided to cuss the car because the car had stopped in his way even though he was stopped traveling across against the light. And I, being a minister fully in control of all of my faculties and emotions, when he pulled alongside me on the sidewalk, was, was filled enough with the Holy Spirit that I was able to roll down my window and encourage him. Um, in the way I think he should have been riding the bike. Immediately after which he suggested I do something which I believe is a physical impossibility. A man of God. A preacher. Not only called to represent the Lord. But called to encourage others to do so as well. And to equip them to walk in a way that is worthy of the manner, the positions to which we've been called. And the devil doesn't make it any easier. He'll help your spouse give you grief. He'll cause your children to fight. 
He'll send every thought in the world to make you think you're all alone or that no one understands or that you might as well quit even trying. If you're like me, sometimes it seems that God expects and life requires more than I have to give. When I think about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I feel overwhelmed. Jesus tells us we are supposed to be merciful. That we are to focus on storing treasures in heaven and to trust God to provide for us in this life. He says turn the other cheek and if someone requires you to go one mile with them you go the extra mile. Oh and by the way unless your righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees you can forget about getting to heaven and while you're trying to exceed them don't judge them. Sounds like Jesus requires an awful lot. And am I the only one overwhelmed by his expectations? And James is writing to people who not only have these expectations of Christ placed on them, but to people who have been dispersed, scattered across the Roman Empire because of their faith in Jesus. He is writing to people who not only face the pressures of living Christ-honoring lives, they have not only the pressures of daily living, of paying the bills and cleaning the house and fixing the meals and pleasing their boss and customers. But he is writing to people who have also lost everything they have spent a lifetime accumulating. They have lost their homes. They have been driven out of their communities. You know, it's one thing to walk with the Lord when what you're facing is what everyone else faces every day. It is one thing to walk with the Lord when it is a normal day, but it's something else to trust the Lord when unexpected trials come. It's something else to trust the Lord when a doctor's report is not good. It's something else to trust the Lord when your child doesn't come home at night. It's something else to trust the Lord when the IRS calls and says, we need to have a talk. It is something else to trust the Lord when the school calls and says we're having issues. How do you do that? How do you go on when all you want to do is quit? How do you go on when you want to throw in the towel? Say the expectations are too great. The trials too numerous. The success is too few. The disappointment is too great. James gives us the answer to that question in verse 5. Verse 5, it says, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. Oh, how many times have I claimed this verse? That the Lord has promised to give wisdom if we ask. But one thing that we often overlook is the setting in which this verse is placed. Oh, I believe the Lord will give us wisdom if we ask. I believe the Lord will guide us if we ask. The Bible tells us in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I'm familiar with those. But this specific promise comes in the place of trials and difficulties. Right after he tells us, in the midst of trials that we are to rejoice, to count it all joy. And when you're scratching your head and wondering how in the world to do that, it is then that James says, ask for wisdom. In other words, when we don't know how to turn the other cheek. When we don't know how to find the joy in the midst of the storm. It is then that we ask. And asking the Lord is simply another word for pray. Now how is it that we are to pray? Verse 5, James says, 
ask. You know, there are some people who never ask anyone for anything. Because that means humility and humbling themselves. They're more than happy to help you with a problem or to help you with something. But they'll never ask for themselves. Often those who will never ask refuse to do so because of pride. They want to handle things themselves. They don't want to need anyone for anything. And sadly, some people feel the same way about God. They don't want to go to Him. They don't want to ask Him for anything. They just want to handle it themselves. James chapter 4 and verse 2, James says, You have not because you ask not. My friend, if you want to make it through, if you want to be able to, to rejoice in the midst of the storm, James says, ask. Ask with humility. And second, ask with respect. The Bible doesn't tell us that we are to tell God what we need. James says, ask the Lord. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. I want you to remember that word request. Let your request be made known unto God. We are to ask God. Every month for a couple of years I got together with other pastors here in our community for fellowship and prayer. And quite honestly, sometimes it bothered me when I heard some of them pray. They would say, God, give me this, and God, do that. They talked like they were commanding God to do something like he was a dog waiting to fetch whatever they requested. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, Isaiah says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Guess what? God knows more stuff than you do. And he knows more stuff than I do. That means I don't always know what to pray for. And I don't know, always know what is best. I don't want God to give me everything I pray for. I want him to give me what is best. Because I can't see around the corner tomorrow. I can't see down the street of next month. But my God can. Ms. Billy Graham once said that if God had answered all of her prayers, she would have married the wrong man several times my friend when you pray remember you're talking to the almighty all knowing ever present God not the pizza delivery boy you're talking to the God who knows more than you'll ever know he sees around the corner of tonight and down the road of tomorrow we ask with humility and we ask with respect and we ask with passion Matthew chapter 7 Beginning in verse 5, Jesus says, Ask, knock, seek. Or ask, seek, knock. We're to ask with passion. We're not to be indecisive. We're to be passionate. In other words, what you desire means something to you. It's important to you. The most fatal thing in the Christian life is to be content with passing desires. If you really want to know God, if you really want to have victory in the midst of the storm and light in the midst of the darkness, if you really want to be a man or a woman of God, then ask like you mean it. Let your prayers have passion. You pray and ask for wisdom, for insight, for answers like you mean it. It amazes me the number of people who pray without passion. Like they don't really care if God answers their prayers or not. Let me ask you, my friend. Do you pray that God will protect your son or your daughter, your grandson or granddaughter with passion? Do you pray that God will keep them pure? Do you pray that God will give them a godly spouse? How can you pray such prayers without passion? Do you pray that God will give you wisdom when you interact with them? Do you pray that the Lord will give you wisdom and guide your family through a trial or through a struggle? Do you pray that God will help you be the parent and example he wants you to be for your children or grandchildren? Do you realize what's at stake? Do you pray that God will save your neighbors? 
That he will transform you into a person who can say like Paul, the things you have seen me do, you do also. Do you realize how important you are in their lives? Do you realize how important the way you face trials and difficulties is in the lives of your children and those who watch you? Because it is how you handle trials that will determine whether or not they believe that you believe in God. That you know a God who you trust will get you through all difficulties and circumstances. You realize that through your prayer, God works to change the world. Oh, my friend, pray with passion. For you can rest assured that if your prayer means nothing to you, that it means nothing to God. Pray with humility. Ask with respect and passion. And pray with persistence. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Verse 7 Jesus tells us to ask and to seek and to knock. If there is anything other than passion he's striving to emphasize is the importance of persistence. We keep on asking, we keep on seeking and we keep on knocking. It's strange he commands us to keep asking when in chapter 6 and verse 32 Jesus says that God knows we need all these things. Why does God ask us to keep on praying? To keep on asking, to keep on knocking, to keep on seeking? Number one, because sometimes there can be delays. Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 through 14. In Daniel we are told that there can be delays in the answers to our prayers. We are in a war. We are involved in a spiritual battle. The devil will do everything he can to delay an answer to your prayers. So you'll quit before you hear an answer. Don't hang up the phone. Don't quit listening. Sometimes there is a delay in our prayer and we are to be persistent, continuing to ask. Because there are delays in our prayer because of a battle. And sometimes there are delays in answers to our prayer because our hearts need changing. In James chapter 4 and verse 3, James says you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly so that you may spend it on your desires for pleasure. Sometimes you ask for the wrong things for the wrong reason. And sometimes God delays answering your prayers because your heart needs changing. Your car breaks down, a trial, and you begin to pray. But do you really need a new car? Or do you just need another car? Do you really need a new job or does your heart need to be changed about the job you have? Are you doing everything God has called you to do in the place that he has placed you? We keep praying. We keep asking for wisdom when we haven't seen an answer because sometimes there's a delay due to the battle that's being waged. Sometimes there is a delay so, because our hearts need changing. Sometimes there's a delay because we need to grow. I dated a fair amount growing up. So I always figured I'd marry pretty young. I figured by the time I was 25, I'd have a house, two cars, a wife, three kids. I had it all planned out. It didn't work out that way. I didn't get married until I was 31. I had known Gladys for five years before we married, four and a half before we even dated. And you know, if God had given me a wife earlier than he did, I never would have appreciated the great gift he has given me. I probably would have taken her for granted. I needed to grow. My heart needed to change so I could see what a great wife he gave me. I needed to grow so that I could appreciate his gift. We continue to pray. We continue to ask and to seek and to knock. We continue to pray for wisdom because there can be delays. We pray with persistence. And we pray with trust. In James chapter 1 there in verse 5. Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask 
in faith, without doubting, for the doubter is like the surge in sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. We ask, we pray with faith. We trust in God's sovereignty. God can only do what he is allowed to do. Both he and our circumstances are subject to God. After losing all of his worldly possessions along with his children, Job didn't say, The Lord giveth and the devil taketh away. Job said, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, there's no such thing as chance. Every circumstance of life, whether good or bad, has been purposefully allowed by God. Every trial, every sickness, every disease, every setback, every hurt that comes into our life has been allowed by God. When adverse circumstances come, we must remember that God is bigger than those circumstances and they are completely under his control. We sometimes say things like, I'm doing fine under the circumstances. The question is, why are you under the circumstances? God is above them and they are bigger than you are. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 38 says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? We pray for the wisdom in the midst of trial. Trust in God's sovereignty and that He is in control. It was 21 years ago this month that my dad was killed six months before Drew was born and at that time there was um, a lot of pain a lot of heartache when we first moved back to Florida to start this church walk on the property out here the place I grew up the place my dad so often said that the Lord had given us to minister to others with and in those early months back here there was seldom a time I could walk on the property without crying but though the Lord allowed that trial and that pain he's used that to open doors to allow me to witness to people that I would not have been able to before we were allowed to give testimony to my dad's life and how in spite of his early passing how he was grateful to be able to be with the Lord and how they could come to know him too when we go through trials we go with trust knowing that God is sovereign and he is in control of all things we trust not only God's sovereignty but we trust his goodness Joseph when his brothers took him and threw him into the pit I'm sure there were times he had doubts when his brother pulled him out and sold him as a slave I'm sure there were times he had doubts when he resisted the temptation of his boss's wife I'm sure there were times that he had doubts when he was imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit and others seemingly forgot him I'm sure there were times he had doubts but little did he know that behind the scenes God was working not only to raise him up to the second highest position in all of Egypt but to use him to prepare a home for his family to come to because God is good Drew was blessed to do very well in school graduated with a 4.3 GPA he um, 
attended Daytona State College while in school, graduated with an associate's degree, had over a 4.0 from the college as well, did very well. When he decided he wanted to go away to school, he sent letters and applications to universities all over our country. And uh, some of those applications were pretty good because daddy would look over his shoulder and help him. The punctuation was correct. The grammar was correct. And yet in spite of all of the applications and in spite of those at the school telling us if you send out enough letters and apply for enough scholarships you'll get enough money to get through college. In spite of all of that he got no scholarships from any of those letters. Reluctantly, very disappointed, he decided to stay home and go to UCF to stay with mom and daddy and commute back and forth. It's amazing how God has worked. Every semester since he started school there, the school has sent a letter. Oh, we're going to give you a grant this semester. We're going to give you a scholarship this semester, if things continue the way they are now, in December, Drew will graduate with more money than he had when he started school at UCF. Disappointed. Getting good grades. Doing everything everyone tells you to do. And only finding later that God had him exactly where he wanted him. James says, when the trials come, the difficulties come, the disappointments come, you're tempted to quit. And you wonder where God is in the midst of it all. You ask for wisdom. And you trust God's sovereignty. That he is still in the throne, on the throne of the universe in charge of all things. You trust that he is still good. In spite of how things look. You pray for wisdom. Wisdom.